This experience happened to me in Fort Worth, Texas in the year 2003, when I was still a sophomore in my high school. Me, my brother Chris, and a friend of ours who for the sake of the story I will call Robert, were all bored one day in the fall and decided to go explore a tunnel that led into the sewers under a bridge just because we had nothing better to do. The day that we did this, it was sort of a last minute kind of thing. Not very much planning or thought was put into it. Anyways, this is how I remember it happening all these years later. My brother Chris had invited our friend Robert over after school. We wanted to do something different this time aside from just playing video games. We suggested that we all go outside and go walking in the field behind our house. And as we did that, we decided to cross the street beyond the field, where there was a pretty busy street with traffic throughout the day. After Jake walking across, we walked towards the bridge underpass. We carefully walked down into the swamp under the bridge, trying not to slide into the dirty looking water below. We saw lots of graffiti down there, and a tunnel opening to the sewers, and we thought, why not go exploring? We thought we would be safe as a trio. So my brother Chris entered first, me being in the middle and Robert at the rear. The tunnel wasn't wide enough for us to walk side by side. It was so narrow that we had to walk single file in a straight line. We used the lights on our cell phones. Now let me clarify that this was before smartphones and iPhones. So the lights on our cell phone screens were all that we had to navigate. We had some light peering through the outside from the sewer grates above, but it wasn't really much to make a difference. We traveled at a reasonable pace, seeing a lot of graffiti on both sides of us as we walked. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred as we made our way down. We heard a lot of cars passing on the street above us. Everything sounded and looked okay for the most part. Then we got to the end of the tunnel. It led into a room with a sewer manhole with a lid closed and two more tunnel openings, one on the left and the other on the right. Now, you would expect this room to be covered in graffiti, but strangely, there were only three words spray-painted in white. The wrong way. Now, it was at this moment that we all started to feel a bit on edge, as if someone that was concealed by the surrounding darkness was watching us. We immediately started hearing sounds from the other tunnels. There came a torrent of what sounded like voices crying out in agony along with loud stomping footsteps, as if someone in boots was making their way towards us. The horrific sounds emanating from the tunnels were distorted and seemed to bounce off the walls around us. It reminded me of the scene in The Haunting of Hell House, where the two leads of the movie started hearing footsteps of a ghost before it starts pounding on their bedroom door. We all immediately turned around and ran back the way we had come from. As before, Chris was in front, I was in the middle, and Robert at the rear. We all were terrified that someone was right behind us, as the relentless footsteps picked up their pace. I remember Robert was kind of pushing and shoving me, because he was probably the most terrified being at the very back. As we ran, the hellish torrent of voices seemed to intensify, then they all suddenly ceased at once. We made it out of the opening of the tunnel and immediately made our way back to the top of the bridge, never looking back. As soon as we felt that we were safe, we finally stopped to catch our breath, and then we talked about what happened for hours. We came to the conclusion that it was probably just some homeless people living down there. They probably heard us and set off to scare us in the only way they could, and the ominous graffiti sign, the wrong way, was probably put up by them as a warning to stay away. Regardless of what happened, we never did anything like that again. I have not been to that sewer tunnel since, nor do I ever plan to. In all these years, I've never told this story to anyone. To all you young kids out there who are bored and want to find something to do, do yourself a favor and stay away from sewer tunnels. You never know what you're going to find or hear down there. Back in the spring of 1999, when I was 16, my family moved to a small mountain town in Colorado. I didn't mind the surrounding forests or the isolation at all, because I was already an outdoorsy type of person. I enjoyed hiking up hills and wandering down dirt paths. I quickly became friends with the only other kid my age who lived nearby. His name was Kyle. 
One evening, shortly before the start of summer, Kyle and I had been wandering through the woods and found a narrow river that flowed across the property. Being bored kids, our immediate reaction was to jump in and swim upstream and have fun. We kept at it until sundown. But instead of packing it in, set them down on the riverbank and keep swimming. After maybe another 10 minutes, Kyle became very quiet and gestured for me to swim closer to him. When I was within arm's reach, he whispered to me, Look over my shoulder, towards the tree line. I think someone is there pacing back and forth. I would have immediately dismissed his words as just him jumping at shadows, but the genuine concern in his voice made me pause. I glanced over to where he had indicated and scanned the tree line for a few weary seconds, but didn't notice anything moving. I said something to the effect of, it's either an animal or just shadows, dude. No one has any business being on this property, and I doubt anyone else knows about this section of river. That didn't seem to put Kyle's mind at ease at all. He turned back around and looked towards the tree line again, and for a moment, there was complete silence. Did you just hear that? Kyle asked. I told him that I didn't hear anything. Kyle asked if I would walk up to the bank with him and investigate to see if there was anything there. I told him if we got out, we wouldn't want to go back in, and I kind of wanted to swim some more. Kyle didn't respond, but instead swam out towards the bank and climbed out of the water. I continued to swim like a moronic kid, oblivious to the notion that me diving forward into the water in the dark could have resulted in me caving my head in on a hidden rock or something. I'm not sure how much time passed before I suddenly began to feel very alone. I turned back towards the bank and I didn't see Kyle anywhere. Both of the flashlights were still untouched, lying in the sand by our shoes. I called out for Kyle as I climbed out of the water, but he didn't seem to respond. I picked up my flashlight and scanned the trees with the beam. I called out for Kyle again, half convinced that he was just messing with me. But again, silence was the only response. I took a few careful steps into the woods, around the area that Kyle had pointed out earlier. I was getting ready to call his name out again when I noticed him. He was standing facing away from me several yards away, staring deeper into the forest. I walked over to him, but he didn't turn towards me as I moved closer. I shouted something along the lines of, Kyle, you jerk! Why aren't you answering me? I reached out to grab his shoulder, but before I could... He slowly raised one hand and pointed a trembling finger towards the shadows. Can you see that? What is that? I shined the flashlight at his face. I could see that he was bone white and his eyes were as wide as sewer covers. I barely noticed it at the time, but one detail I'll never be able to forget was a single droplet of blood running down from his nose. I turned the light in the direction that he was pointing and asked, What? It was like time had stopped. My flashlight beam caught a pair of legs in dark pants, and I felt my heart skip a beat. The flashlight felt extremely heavy in that moment, and if I were in any other circumstances, I would have snapped the beam light upwards immediately. But all I could do was slowly raise my arm as if I was fighting gravity itself. The legs simply kept going. Then the torso appeared. When my flashlight traveled all the way up past its chin, it had a very wide and gummy smile. It was the scariest face I had ever seen. I flipped my shit and dropped my flashlight. I collided with Kyle as I turned, and we both hit the ground. I screamed for him to run. Then I took off like a maniac back down the river and back at the path we had taken, abandoning everything else including my friend. I lost count of how many times I tripped. It was at least six, maybe as many as ten. But I continued to leap back to my feet and kept sprinting, using only the starlight through the overhead branches and the distant glow of indoor lights where my house was to navigate. I didn't say anything to Kyle. I was certain that I could hear him only a few steps behind me, crashing around the sticks just as loudly as I was. I shot through the garage door into the kitchen, screaming bloody murder. My arms and face were bruised and bloody, and at some point, 
I had lost one of my sneakers. But I barely registered that as I cried for my parents to call the police. I looked around behind me for Kyle, but he wasn't there. Assuming that he had run back to his own house, I asked my parents to call his parents after the police arrived. I was shaking so badly when the cops came, and they seemed concerned that I might have been overdosing on something. Then we got the phone call from Kyle's parents, and they were checking to see if Kyle had come home with me. And the police called in a team of dogs and extra men to scan the area. They located our belongings by the river, but they found no trace of Kyle or the stranger. The search lasted months, and over a hundred miles worth of forest was searched, but no trace of him was ever found. To this day, Kyle has never been seen again. There was media coverage at the time, but given that we were in a small town where people get lost in the woods often, I don't know how far the story spread. What is probably the most heartbreaking is that Kyle's family is still without any answers. I live with the guilt of his disappearance every day. I doubt that I'll ever forgive myself for not stopping to make sure that he was behind me. To this day, I'm sure I can recall the sound of his footsteps behind me as I ran, so I don't know at what point he stopped, or if the thing grabbed him. Another thought has crossed my mind numerous times. What if it wasn't Kyle that I heard behind me? I'm a 14-year-old girl from Ireland. A few months ago, before my family moved houses, we lived in kind of a bad neighborhood where a lot of crime took place. One day, I traveled by train to get to my cousin's house, as the journey would be too long on foot and I had to be there at a certain time. I scanned my ticket, sat down, and began reading a book I had brought with me. From somewhere nearby, I heard these strange sobbing sounds and someone panting as though they were having an anxiety attack. I tried ignoring it, but it just got worse. Eventually, I looked up and saw a young woman, who looked to be in her early to late 20s, crying with her head in her hands. I immediately got up and asked if she was alright. She then sat up and looked at me. I remember the petrified look on her face, and her eyes being full of tears, and she was shaking. I was also wondering why the hell everyone else on the train was just sitting there, because apart from the passengers with headphones in their ears, they could all hear her. She never answered me. After we locked eyes, she abruptly sprinted to another seat, about two rows up from where she was before. She began staring at the ground, with her long hair falling over her shoulders and face. I was worried that I had upset her even more, and assumed that she wanted to be left alone. Whatever was wrong with her was private. So I sat back down and tried reading again, but I couldn't take my mind off of what just happened. It honestly made me shiver to the point where I became paranoid for the rest of the ride. After the next two stops, I looked around, since I didn't hear any more crying. She was gone, and I assumed that she had gotten off. The next stop was mine. As I was walking to my cousin's house, I kept thinking about the woman I had encountered, wishing that I had acted differently. The next day, after I got back home, I was scrolling through my news feed when I came across an article about a 32-year-old journalist named Jennifer, who had been found dead and mutilated just two streets away from the train station. I saw a picture, and I almost dropped my phone as my heart stopped. It was her. I recognized her face and hair. There was also a graphic censored image of her body, According to the story, her body was found gutted and soaked in blood, with her clothes torn to shreds. Her innards were strewn about her dismembered corpse, and she looked as though she had been dead for a while. This made me sick. I wish I had never clicked on that story. Later that night, I saw many more bigger news networks covering it. Last I heard, they never found out who did it. But apparently she had been sexually assaulted before being killed. An anonymous witness later told the police that he had seen her crying on the train. I felt extremely sorry for this poor girl, for the horrific accounts of agony she must have gone through. She must have had some idea what was going to happen to her, for her to be crying like that. It still shakes me to my core thinking back on this. I told my mother, and she reported what I saw to the police. She never wanted me to take the train again after that. 
My cousin told me that before anyone else arrived at her house the night I came over, she had seen a suspicious looking man in what looked to be jeans and a black hoodie slowly walking past their house. She didn't see his face and didn't think much of it at the time. After she found out what happened, she became traumatized and didn't go out for weeks afterwards, not even to go to school. I hope that woman rests in peace and that her family finds justice. I'll never look or think of a train in the same way again. I live in North Hollywood, California. My brother and I live together in a nice quiet neighborhood where not even car break-ins happen. Trust me, in North Hollywood, there aren't many neighborhoods like that. A few years ago, my next door neighbor, Jillian, adopted a dog to keep her older dog company while she was at work. I work from home, so she would often ask me to let her dogs out around lunch and sometimes again around 4 p.m. if she was working late. One day Jillian called and said she had a meeting after work and asked if I could go over twice that day. I said yes, and at around 12 p.m. I went over for my first visit. Now, I should explain the basic layout of Jillian's house. As you walk through the front door, it's a pretty straight shot from the door, through the living room and dining room to get to the back door, which obviously leads into the backyard. The bedrooms and bathroom were on the left side of the house, and the kitchen was on the right side. Jillian always closes the doors, leaving just the dining room and living room for the dogs to hang out in. As I made my way through, I noticed that all the doors were closed as usual, and greeted the dogs, and took them into the backyard to do their business and run around. While we were outside, I couldn't help but shake the feeling that I was being watched. I started to feel very uneasy. I heard the dogs back inside as calmly as I could, made sure everything was locked up, and then I walked home. At around 4 p.m., I started back over for my second visit, and as I approached the front door and put the key in, I had this sinking feeling in my chest. I shrugged it off and went inside so I could take care of the dogs. As I walked over to them, I noticed that one of the bedroom doors was wide open. I let the dogs out and started thinking back to my first visit. I was fairly certain that the doors were all closed. I thought to myself, maybe Jillian forgot something and came back to the house and forgot to tell me. I pulled out my phone and called her. Hey, did you come back home earlier? I'm here to let the dogs out and I saw that your bedroom door was open. What she said next chilled me to the bone. No, I'm just getting in my car to head home now. Why? I wanted to run and scream, but I decided to act as normal as possible because I didn't know if whoever opened the bedroom door was still in the house. I told Jillian that I was calling the cops and hung up. I left the dogs in the backyard and went back inside and said aloud as calmly as I could, Bye guys, see you tomorrow. But as I exited the house and started to dial 911, I heard Jillian's front door open and a tall, thin man, I would say about in his 30s, emerged from the doorway and began to run towards me. I ran as fast as I could to my door, which wasn't locked. I slammed the door behind me and locked it, and that's when I heard from the other side of the door, I'm coming for you, bitch. Before I could hit the call button, I heard a window break in the kitchen. I realized that my brother was not home and had to fend for myself. I ran into my brother's room, went through his closet and found a baseball bat. I could now hear the guy walking around my house looking for me. He came into my brother's room and looked under the bed. I stood up from my place in the closet and prepared for him to find me. I was sobbing as quietly as I could and praying that I would get a swing in before he got me. He stood up and made his way over to the closet. He opened the door and I swung and hit him in the chest. He fell to the ground, but managed to get right back up and knock the bat out of my hands and then shoved me to the ground. He then started dragging me out of the room. There in the hallway he met my brother, who had a knife. He had come home after he realized that he forgot his wallet. He stabbed the guy in his shoulder and the intruder moaned as he fell to the floor. My brother kicked him in the face and told me to call the cops. Just then I heard sirens outside. Jillian had called the cops right after we had hung up. She knew that it was her crazy ex-husband who had broken into her house. The cops dragged the man out of my house, but later confessed that he had planned on killing Jillian, but heard that I had called her. So he decided to kill me and anyone else in my house as well. 
He was not well in the head, if you catch my drift. I hate to think of what would have happened to me if my brother hadn't forgot his wallet. This happened when I was 15. My dad and I were driving my sister from San Diego to Austin, Texas, where she would start her new job. She had lived in Guam for a year, and she couldn't afford to ship her car all the way to Texas, only to California. So my dad and I loaded up her car and began the drive all the way to the Lone Star State. We had been going for a few hours and decided to stop in El Centro to get some gas and use the bathroom. I didn't have to go so I volunteered to pump the gas as my dad and sister went inside. There were a few other cars at the pumps and in the parking lot. There was a man about 5'10", average size. He was at the pump adjacent to ours. As soon as I threw some trash away, he began giving me this look of sheer malice and hate. Being the unathletic turd that I am, I was slightly intimidated. My father walked out of the store and told me that he bought $35 worth of gas. He didn't seem to notice the strange man staring at me as he climbed in the driver's seat. He was looking at his phone. I began to pump the gas and tried to make the best of the situation. My sister walked out of the store and I averted my eyes to look at her. And then I saw from my peripheral vision the man reaching into his pocket and producing a knife. He then harshly whispered to me to get into his car or he was going to stab me. I went in full defense mode and shoved the guy as hard as I could, knocking him off balance. He hit the gas hose that connected to his car, spraying him in gasoline. As he fell backward, I hung up my gas hose and yelled at my sister to get into the car and for my dad to fire it up. We jumped in the car and I think my dad saw the knife because he floored it the hell out of there. I saw the guy jump into his white Chevy and turn it on, but by that time, we were already out of the station and going back to the interstate. I told dad what happened and he drove even faster to get back to the interstate. I then looked out of the back window and saw the same white Chevy weaving in between traffic, seemingly chasing after us. He pulled up next to us and that's when I saw that there was someone else in the passenger seat. The passenger rolled down his window and pointed a handgun at us, screaming at us to pull over. Instead, my dad hit the gas, bringing us up to almost 100 miles per hour. The Chevy was still next to us. Suddenly, my dad shouted at me and my sister to get down and brace ourselves. The Chevy then abruptly swerved and sideswiped us, but the collision caused them to lose focus, sending them into the far lane, where they hit the back of a semi going at least 90. As we sped away, we saw that their whole front end was smashed and they were forced to pull over. We got off the next exit and went to a police station and reported the incident. After about an hour, they told us they found the broken down Chevy. Both the assailants had left it behind and had fled on foot even before the truck driver could get out of his rig. Apparently, when I described the appearance of the guy, the police knew that he was a serial offender and had reports of him luring children into his car across the southwest and bringing them back to Mexico. He was wanted on several counts of kidnapping. After a few days, we were able to continue our move to Texas, and the rest of the trip went off without a hitch. I am a 22-year-old female from South Texas. The town where I live in is small and is still growing, and due to the lack of entertainment, we sometimes go to Houston or one of the other big cities nearby. Given the situation, my family decided to surprise me with tickets to a concert to one of my favorite artists, and I would be joined by my sister. I was excited and thought it would be a great time. It was a three-hour drive there and back. We had a wedding to go to the next day, so we decided to save some time and take some back roads. I wish we could have stayed at the hotel. After the amazing concert, we decided to get some Taco Bell and head back. Mind you, this was around 11.30 p.m. Everything was going fine until the low tire pressure light came on. My sister pulled over and got out of the car to check things out. I could hear her curse. The tire was not only low on pressure, but completely deflated. My sister and I were both raised to be independent. You can save a few extra bucks on things by doing them yourself. So it goes without saying that we knew how to change a tire. While we were in the process, there was a man that emerged from a nearby tree line. He was about six foot tall, 
What really caught my eye was how well he was dressed. He wore a suit and had this creepy smile. He walked up to us and offered to help. We kindly denied, but he just stood there and continued to stare at us. We made up a white lie and said that our parents were on the way and they would be here any second to help us. We told him this in the hopes that he would just leave, and he eventually did, and just turned around and walked back into the tree line without saying another word. I thought it was weird how he came out of the tree line at the perfect time. Just when we thought it was over, the same man comes back out, except this time, there was a knife in his hand, and he was wearing a black mask. I freak out as he runs up to our car and sinks his knife into the rear passenger side tire. Me and my sister scramble into the car through the driver's side doors, and we lock it just in time. That's when a white truck pulls up behind us. We thought it was someone coming to help us, but that's when we saw three more men wearing black masks exit the truck and surround our car. The three men start banging on the windows, while the guy with the suit gets on top of the hood and began to drag his knife across the windshield, making this awful scratching sound. At this point, we had called the cops, but there was no sign of them showing up anytime soon. One of the men banged on the window so hard, I thought it was going to break. That's when the man in the suit jumps down off the hood and reaches into his suit and pulls out a gun. I thought that we were dead in that instant. I began to pray while my sister started screaming hysterically. The guy walks up to the rear passenger side window, points his gun, and shoots sending shards all over the back seat. The first shot didn't break the glass enough, so he pulled the trigger again. My heart has never raced so fast in my life. The masked man used his gun to move away some of the remaining glass and unlock the back door. During all this commotion, I had retrieved my pepper spray from my travel bag. The man made his way inside the car, and at that moment I suddenly turned around and practically emptied the entire bottle in his face. The man immediately put his free hand over his eyes and began to scream. He pointed the gun at my sister, and at that moment I couldn't breathe. It was like the entire world froze. But for whatever reason, the man didn't pull the trigger. And that's when I heard the fast approaching police sirens. The masked men fled and jumped back into their truck, and within seconds, we saw their taillights disappearing into the night. The police arrived too late, but we gave our report. I tried my best to give a description, but most of what came out of my mouth was gibberish. I was obviously pretty shaken up over what happened. The police combed the area, and it turns out we were at the wrong place at the wrong time. These men had set up nails on the road and were waiting for their next victim. They were possibly human traffickers. The police put out an APB on the truck, but as far as I know, they never found the men responsible. Always be careful when you're driving on the back roads of Texas. These men could still be out there, looking for their next victims. And always be sure to bring something with you to protect yourself. It just might save your life. Before I begin my story, I would like to send my thoughts and prayers to anybody who has been the victim of stalking or harassment. I know firsthand how it feels to have eyes constantly watching you. This experience still haunts me to this day. My name is Jackson. When this happened, I was a freshman out of Texas. I used to go to a vocational school instead of a regular high school. Vocational schools have what I like to call a rotation cycle. For a week, you have regular classes like math and English, science and history, among a few other electives. The next week, you'll have math and English, but after that, you go to a shop class for the rest of the day. Adam is the definition of a kid who no one wants to be around. He's always on his phone, thinks he's smarter than everyone else, failing every class, wears pants under his ass, and worst of all, he has this god-awful laugh. It first started in academic classes. I was on my way to math, and he was walking past me in the opposite direction. Sup, Jackson? He said while giving me an upward nod. I took it as a friendly gesture, returned his nod, and kept walking. I don't know why, but 
I feel like I had to look back. I was surprised to find Adam was staring at me, and I quickly ducked into my math class. English class was next. Adam is in my English class and sits next to me. I sat down in class and took out my notes. Adam walked in and I let out an exaggerated sigh. I began to write my answer for the day's prompt. After a few minutes of English, I began to get this feeling like I was being watched. I glanced out of the corner of my eye and saw that Adam was staring daggers at me with these blank, dead eyes. I turned my attention back to the lesson. Fifteen minutes go by, and the feeling washed over me again. I looked in Adam's direction, and he was still staring at me. His chair also appeared to be closer than it was before. I figured that he shifted his body and his chair moved closer as a result. After English, Adam and I had one other class together. Foundations in Technical Math. It was my last class of the day. I sat down and took out my laptop. Hello, Jackson, a familiar voice said. I turned to face my teacher, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell was a very helpful teacher. I would often stay after school and get extra work done. Adam walked into the room and made his way past me, dragging his tattered hoodie against the back of my neck. We sat on opposite sides of the classroom, so interaction between us was minimized. Finally, the bell rang. I picked up my stuff and walked out. While most of the students walked through the cafeteria or the front entrance, I would take an exit that's around the side entrance that's rarely used. As I'm walking towards my bus, I see Adam staring at me. I didn't see him that weekend, though I mostly kept to myself. Monday rolled around before I was ready for it, and it was back to the grind. I had just walked into my programming classroom. My teacher gave me a friendly smile, as he always did. After everyone got into shop, the teacher announced that we would be getting a new student. I was excited at the possibility of making a new friend, but all that changed when Adam showed his face. He came in with a goofy, shit-eating grin. Adam sat down next to me and scooted uncomfortably close. Sup, Jackson? <laughs> Adam said with his stupid, obnoxious laugh. I pushed his chair away from me with my foot. The rest of the shop was uneventful, as Adam was getting the rundown from the teacher. When the bell rang and everyone left, the teacher pulled me aside. Jackson, is everything okay? He asked, giving me a once-over. I guess he noticed my disposition during the entire class. At that moment, I knew I could no longer hide my frustration. I shook my head and told him about Adam's unnerving behavior. Unfortunately, Adam was not sent to the dean's office, but he said that he would make sure that we weren't partners on anything. I thanked him for that and went to get on my bus. On my way to the bus, I turned around to see that Adam was following me, not casually going in the same direction. It was like he was following me and trying not to be noticed. I got on the bus and looked out the window to see Adam giving me that cold dead stare once again. At this point, my mind was racing. What the hell is this guy's deal? Is he obsessed with me? Does he want a relationship? Does he want to kill me? Later that night, I was hanging out in my basement playing Xbox when a tap came from the storm door. I looked at the position of the locks. Thankfully, they were secured. I decided to look through the peephole just in case. No one was on the other side of the door. I ran up to the ground level windows and peered out into the darkness. No one was on the porch, but there was someone in a hoodie walking down the street. At the time, I didn't put two and two together, but I did have a sinking feeling in my stomach. The next time I saw Adam was in my Thursday algebra class. I was sitting in my seat taking notes when Adam walked in and sat down at my table. He didn't take out a laptop or a notebook. He just sat down and stared at the board. I glanced over at Adam, only to be met by his blank eyes. The teacher noticed Adam's odd behavior and sent him to a table in the back. For the rest of the class, I felt Adam's eyes on me the whole time. My algebra teacher pulled me aside after class and asked me about Adam. 
At this point, all my teachers were starting to notice Adam's odd behavior towards me. Fast forward a few months, and Adam's obsession was in full swing. He would always stare at me and make comments like, I love you, and we'll be together forever. These remarks became even worse after Adam realized that I wasn't interested. I just don't swing that way. The situation became almost unbearable, and I began to reach my breaking point. As a result of Adam's behavior, he lost a friend of his, and it turns out me and Adam's former friend both loved to fish. That April, his friend Derek and I went on a fishing trip with my father. We stayed at this crappy motel during the trip, and then we dropped off Derek at his house. At about 3.12 in the morning, my phone buzzed. Mm. I grabbed it off my nightstand, still half asleep, and checked it. The message was from an unknown number, but I had a feeling that I knew who it was. The message simply said, Hello. I didn't pay it much mind and tried to go back to sleep, but a few seconds later, another message came through. Is this your house? A picture dropped under the message. It took me a moment to process the picture, but my heart stopped when I was able to make out that it was a photo of my house. I crawled on my hands and knees down the stairs to avoid detection. About halfway down, I was able to see through one of the windows a person in a hoodie standing in my front lawn. The mysterious person's face could not be seen from where I was. I cursed under my breath, and my phone went off again. The message read, I see you, Jackson. I scrambled back upstairs to my room. I stayed in my room for what felt like an eternity before I even thought to peek out my window. I didn't see anything as I looked over the yard. I didn't go back to sleep that night. At this point, Adam was pestering me almost every day. I had made several complaints against him, but nothing was ever done. As annoying and creepy as Adam was, I knew I could tough out freshman year as long as this didn't escalate further. How wrong I was. One day in Foundations class, Adam was sitting directly behind me. He scooted so close that I could hear his breathing. I felt something graze the back of my neck. I turned around to see Adam staring at me with his stupid shit-eating grin. That's it! I yelled. At this point, I had had enough. I spun around and grabbed Adam by the collar. Adam was laughing like a jackass, while everyone else in the room stared at us. Take it easy, Jackson. It's just a joke. <laughs> I was practically screaming at Adam when Mr. Campbell walked in. Take it easy. That's the only thing you can say after joining my shop to follow me? Coming to my house in the middle of the night? Stealing my phone number and harassing me constantly? Why don't you just leave me the hell alone? Mr. Campbell got between us and ended up sending Adam to the principal's office. After class, Mr. Campbell pulled me aside and warned me about using physical force to deal with my problems, although I was driven to that point, because the school administration decided to do absolutely nothing about Adam's unwanted advances. Over the remaining six months of school, Adam kept harassing me. A decent chunk of the student body knew about the situation, and almost all of them sided with me including two juniors on my bus named Colin and David. They were really good friends of mine. They both knew about the situation and did their best to help. Colin and David were in the shop next to mine. Every time class would let out and they saw Adam trying to get close, they made sure he backed off. I made it through my freshman year, and it was now summer break. It was a warm summer night. I was home alone, sitting in the kitchen, browsing the internet on my laptop, when my phone vibrated. Mm. I looked down at my phone. Again, it was a text from an unknown number. I hope you'll forgive me. My heart rate raised a bit. At this point, I thought that Adam would have better things to do over summer break than to harass me. But my blood ran cold. When I heard the sound of shattering glass from my living room, Jackson, I'm here. <laughs> he called out in his irritating voice, followed by his obnoxious laughter. My heart thundered in my chest. I crouched on my hands and knees and peered out from behind the counter, 
only to see Adam holding a knife in his left hand and duct tape in his right. My mind raced to think of a way to defend myself, then it hit me. My dad had a 357 revolver in his nightstand. I always hated guns, but Adam left me with no choice. I slowly made my way towards the stairs. Walking up the steps was like crossing a minefield. When I put my weight on the top step, an awful creaking sound echoed throughout the house, giving away my location. I felt my whole world collapse in that very moment. If it wasn't for the heavy, unrelenting footsteps from Adam's boots crossing the living room, I probably wouldn't have found the courage to sprint into my parents' room and lock myself in. Moments after I locked the door, there came a pounding, and Adam started psychotically taunting me. Come on, Jackson. It won't hurt much. I promise I'll make it quick. I knew that Adam had lost his mind. The door began to splinter due to Adam's pounding. I tried opening the drawer on the nightstand, but it wouldn't budge. I dug through a jar of change on my dad's desk, and I finally found the keys. I opened the nightstand and rapidly dug through the mess in the drawer. Right as I felt the handle of the gun, the bedroom door burst open, and Adam came charging in with a knife raised. Now I've got you! Adam lunged at me, stabbing me in my chest. I screamed, and the gun fell to the side. Adam pulled the knife out and brought it down again, but I managed to grab his wrist before he could stab me. It was now or never. It took every ounce of my strength to reach for the gun. My hand wrapped around the handle, and my fingers slipped over the trigger. I had no way of knowing if it was loaded or not. In one fluid motion, I pointed the gun against the side of Adam's neck and squeezed the trigger. There was a bright flash of light, and my ears rang. I looked around with the gun still in my hand, and saw that Adam was now on his side, choking and gasping for breath. There was a massive hole in the side of his neck. He stared at me with his mouth open, and I watched as his life slipped away. I made my way downstairs, clutching my stab wound, and dialed 911. I don't remember much after that. I woke up in a hospital sometime later with my parents sitting next to me. I explained to them and the police the entire story, and made sure to tell them that the school did absolutely nothing about Adam for my entire freshman year. The legal situation was a bit messy, but due to the castle doctrine in my state, I didn't face any charges. I was in the hospital for another week before I was allowed to go home. I returned to school the following September as a sophomore, and everyone knew my story. I was mentally fucked up over what happened. Whenever I was asked about the ordeal, I always politely declined to talk about it. Adam's parents were pissed at me, accusing me of harassing him. They refused to accept the fact that Adam had major problems, and they ultimately failed as parents. I know that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. I'm now 25, and I'm engaged to my high school sweetheart, and we're actually expecting our first child. I don't regret what I did to Adam. When you make the stupid choice of breaking into someone's house with a knife, your life is forfeit. This happened to me and a friend of mine a couple years back at our local church. For the sake of the story, my name is Jamie, and we'll call my friend Mark. We were pretty young back then. I was 13 and Mark was only 12. This church is located in San Antonio, Texas, and also happens to be one of the oldest churches in the area. This all began around noon. We ended up hanging around church after mass, waiting for our monthly youth meeting to begin, but we still had two hours to kill. We headed for a trail that went through the churchyard, but continued past the grounds into a nearby preservation. This trail was also commonly used by cyclists, but we walked these trails just to kill time and to feel a little rebellious in our young minds. As we walked by this bench that was no more than a minute into the trail, me and my friend noticed something on the bench. There was this dirty pillow, and there was no one nearby. I dare you to take a nap and wait till someone wakes you up, Mark said jokingly. I wisely declined the offer. God only knows where that musty pillow has been. We assume that it belonged to one of the many homeless people we've seen around town. 
Eventually, after we got done with our meeting, we headed back to Mark's house. His dad only lived about seven minutes away, and we would usually walk there from church on the nights where I would be staying with Mark. This was one of the few days I actually got to spend the night at Mark's house. Mark's dad had to work early the next morning, and he was asleep by 10. And by midnight, me and Mark were still up, trying to figure out what we should do. Bro, we gotta get out of here. Don't you want to do something else besides playing video games all night? Said Mark. I admitted that the games were getting kind of boring, but there was nothing else to do. Well, what else do you have in mind? I asked him. Let's head to that trail that we like. We'll bring some flashlights and a pocket knife for protection. That sounded like a good idea to me, and I was eager to do something different, so I agreed to go. We would go out at night more often than you would probably think, but granted we never been on the trail this late at night. We put on our sweaters, grabbed some of his dad's pocket knives and some flashlights before going off exploring. As we walked down the dimly lit road, there was this feeling that something wasn't quite right settling in the pit of my stomach. I ignored the feeling and told myself I was being paranoid. As we approached the trail's opening, Mark shined his light through the trees. There were crickets chirping, along with the wind rustling the leaves. After about a minute or so of entering the trail, I thought I heard footsteps behind us. They seemed to slowly die down as we continued. Since this trail was about three quarters of a mile long, it took a little while for us to reach the church grounds. While passing by the bench we encountered earlier that day, we discovered the old dirty pillow was still there. Mark said, <laughs> You can actually take a nap now if you want. I shrugged it off and told him, Let's just get to the end so we can turn around and go home. This place has kind of given me the creeps. By the time we got to the end, I had forgotten all about the faint footsteps I heard earlier, and we turned around and headed back the way we came. At this point, we were a ways away from the bench, but still close enough to see it. We stopped in our tracks as we were startled by the sound of footsteps running. The hell was that? I said under my breath. But before I could figure out what to do, I noticed the pillow was now missing from the bench. I pointed it out to Mark, who was scanning the surrounding area with his flashlight. He pointed it to the bench, and as he did... We both noticed something standing behind a tree and a pair of eyes staring daggers at us. Mark quickly moved the light away and seemed to have the same idea I had. We should act like we didn't see anything and go home the other way. I nodded and followed his lead. As we turned, we heard the sound of someone running at full speed right for us. Mark took off and I quickly followed behind him. The assailant was much faster than us and closing in. I grabbed Mark and pulled him to the side. After switching his light off, I told him in a quiet voice, we should stay here and wait for him to pass and run back. We then heard the distinct sound of heavy breathing nearby and saw a large dark figure through the bushes. When we were sure the figure made its way past us, we made a break for Mark's house. We made it out of the trail and kept going. When we arrived at his house, we were out of breath and covered in sweat. To this day, we don't know who was waiting for us behind the tree, nor do we know what exactly he was planning on doing if he had caught us. Back in the summer of 2016, I got my first job at 18 years old. I was excited about the work, but not about the commute. Without traffic, it was a 30 minute drive both ways and I normally got off work around midnight, and the last thing I wanted to do was drive a half hour to get home. During the first few weeks, I was still getting used to my new routine, and one of the first things my mother told me was to keep an eye on my gas tank, and if I ever needed more, I should leave early and stop on the way, but never on my way back. I understood her concern. I was a petite 18-year-old female, and I looked even younger, but being who I was, I half forgot, half ignored that advice. And one night on my way home, I realized I legitimately didn't have enough gas in the tank to get me to my exit. I pulled into the first station I could find, not caring about the brand or the cost of the gas. I decided to make it as quick as possible, and only put in about $10 worth, just to get myself out of there. The station was empty, and there were sketchy looking people walking up and down the sidewalk, and about 20 different angles where someone could sneak up on me. 
I swiped my card and began pumping gas. And once it got to the $10 mark, I shut it off and printed out my receipt. Thinking the worst was behind me, I was about to climb back into my car and book it home when a voice came from the tiny intercom above the pump. Ma'am, there was a problem with your credit card payment. I paused and glanced at the guy at the counter and felt a chill spiral down my neck. He was one of those tall, gaunt, sketchy-looking clerks and was staring right out the window at me, beckoning me to come inside. I stepped back towards the gas pump and pressed the button on the intercom. What's wrong with my card? I have a receipt. It went through just fine. I didn't try to hide the annoyance in my voice. I didn't like the look of this guy, or the way he sounded. I just need you to come inside, ma'am. Your receipt is incorrect. I'm going to need to run your card in here. He replied, a bit too quickly. I looked back at the guy through the window in frustration. There was no way I was going in there, where I would be alone with him. He was staring at me wide-eyed, like some kind of creep. I stood my ground, pulled out my phone, and checked my credit card app. I held it up stupidly as if he could see it from there, and I pressed the intercom button again. It went through. I see it on my statement. I'm not coming in. Ma'am, if you attempt to leave, I'll call the police. I have your tag number. Please come inside. I then shouted at him from across the parking lot instead of pressing the intercom. Over $10 of gas, they're going to call the cops? Fuck you. I'm leaving. I walked a few steps around my car and gave him the finger. I was just about to walk back around my car and climb into the driver's seat when I paused. It was mouthing something to me through the window. I would have ignored it, but he suddenly looked much more desperate than creepy. He kept beckoning me forward and calling out something that I couldn't hear through the window. I must have made a weird look, because five seconds later he slammed a piece of paper on the window where he had hastily written, Guy in your car. I turned back around and noticed that my passenger rear door was open to crack, which it had definitely not been on the drive from work. I booked it inside the station, and once I was there, the clerk locked the door and told me to get down. He had his eyes on my car and had a gun in his hand. I squatted down behind the counter and watched the security cameras as a tall guy in sweatpants and a windbreaker nudged my back door open, slid out quickly and jogged away into the night. I started freaking out. Turns out the clerk had noticed the guy hanging around the side of the building on the monitors. And as soon as I pulled in, he made a beeline for my car. He crouched down and opened the door and slid himself inside as I was swiping my card, being careful not to close the door all the way behind him so that I wouldn't hear anything. The clerk had noticed all of this on the camera and immediately called the cops, who arrived a few minutes later. They searched the area and my car, but were not able to locate the guy or anything that would lead back to him. The gas station clerk probably saved my life because who knows what would have happened if I had driven off with that stranger in the back seat. I think the lesson here is obvious. It's not enough to be cautious. You have to stay alert as well. Be suspicious, but not stupid. And always listen to your mom. I was 26 when this happened. I was working at a small town grocery store as the early morning baker with a shift starting at 5 a.m. There wasn't an overnight crew at the store, so I was one of the only ones who was there that early in the morning, except for the store owner who started at the same time as me. On this particular day, I didn't have the key to the store because I shared it with the other baker who covered for me on my days off. I wasn't able to get the key before my shift started, as I had off the previous day. It wasn't a big deal though, as I would be able to get into the store when the owner arrived. I've always been a very punctual person and would always arrive 10 to 15 minutes before my starting time. I lived 15 minutes away in another town but I like to give myself a good 30 minutes to get there to account for any possible car troubles or road closures and maybe I'll stop off and get coffee, etc. If I didn't have my key, I would sit outside the front of the store and wait for the owner to arrive to let me in. On this morning, I arrived 15 minutes early, parked, grabbed my belongings, and started making my way towards the store. 
The owner never arrived early. He was always there at 5 a.m. sharp, so I expected to wait the full 15 minutes. I always brought a book to pass the time. I couldn't browse through social media on my phone, since there was very poor reception in this small town in the middle of nowhere. I always parked in the back far left corner of the parking lot, so it was a bit of a ways to get to the building. I was about halfway through the parking lot, and that's when I stopped and looked behind me to the main road, where I saw a very large truck coming down it. The truck suddenly stopped dead in the middle of the road. There was no stop signs or traffic lights, so there was no justifiable reason that this truck would stop, especially at 4.45 in the morning. I was caught off guard by the situation and was just standing there, looking at the truck. I was visible in the dark because I was illuminated by the light of a nearby lamppost. The truck flew into motion and made a sharp turn into the parking lot towards me, and that's when I started sprinting towards the store. I should pause here and give a little context about the structure of the store. It was a multi-business plaza, with the grocery store being on the far right and some other businesses to the left. There's a little walkway between them that leads behind the building, where there is an additional parking lot, a few dumpsters, and a tree line of a nearby forest beyond that. I remembered that I didn't have the key to enter the store. The truck was about halfway through the parking lot, gunning right towards me. When I finally reached the front of the store, I kept running past the door and down the walkway that led between the buildings. As I entered the walkway, I looked back to see the truck turning around and driving around the store making its way to the back of the building. When it was driving around the store, the truck wasn't visible and I quickly ducked down behind some bushes that were planted right up against a pillar. Shortly after, I heard the truck pull up behind the store and idle there for a few minutes. I stayed hidden, looking for something that I could use to defend myself just in case. I settled for holding my car keys between my fingers to use as a makeshift weapon. My mind was racing, trying to wrap my head around what was happening, trying to devise a plan to get out of the situation when I heard a door slam. Whoever was in the truck had gotten out. I didn't want to peek out from my hiding spot, possibly giving away my position. Luckily, the bush was big enough that they wouldn't be able to spot me. I just had to be quiet. So I sat as still as I could. I heard footsteps walking towards me. I was hoping this person would assume that I went into one of the businesses and would just leave. I held my breath. I was sure that at any second they would find me and do God knows what to me. This is the point where I thought about my phone. I knew I didn't have a good cell phone reception in this town, and I didn't think it was worth making noise to search through my bag for it anyways. My hands were gripping my car keys. My knuckles were turning white. My body was trembling. My legs were aching underneath me. But I didn't want to readjust to make the bushes rustle. Whoever this was, was now walking between the buildings. They passed by the bushes I was hiding in, and headed to the front. They stood there silently, looking for me. They didn't say a word. There was nothing but the sounds of their footsteps. They walked past my hiding spot again, back towards their truck. To my relief, I heard the slamming of their truck door as they climbed back in. I then heard the rumble of the engine as it accelerated slowly back around to the front parking lot. I could hear the loud engine of the truck idling in front of the store over the next few minutes before peeling out of the parking lot and down the road. After the truck's engine was no longer audible, I abandoned my hiding spot and ran towards my car, got in and locked the doors. I turned on my car, just in case the truck came back. I sat there and listened, waiting for the rumbling of the truck's engine to come back, but thankfully, it never did. This happened to me in the summer of 2008. At the time, I was 18 and staying with my mother until college started again. She had moved to this area after I started college the year before, so I didn't know the area that well. This is important for the story. My mother often traveled for work, so most days I was on my own. Every week I would stop for a slice of pizza at the shop that was near the house. After a few weeks, an employee of the pizza shop struck up a conversation asking questions like, do I live close, how old was I, what school I went to, etc. 
and ultimately asked me out to go dancing. I don't remember exactly how old he was, but he was definitely older than 21, but younger than 40. Despite only having formally met this guy that day, I stupidly accepted because I was bored. I had been fairly sheltered my whole life, and was extremely shy, and had never been asked out in such a way. I honestly thought that I was rebelling in some way by agreeing to go out with him. I gushed about it to my best friend, who lived in the next county over. She was excited for me. I had already planned to visit her the following day and promised her all the juicy details. I agreed to meet the guy that night outside of the pizza shop. He offered to pick me up from my house, but I said no simply because I didn't want to have to explain to my mother who he was if he ever decided to show up unannounced. At the time, I felt that she asked too many questions, but in reality, she didn't ask enough. And should have just met him at whatever club we were supposed to go to, which he never named. But again, I was a dumb 18-year-old, and I thought this guy was such a gentleman for insisting that he drives me. The second I met up with him, things started going south. I parked my car and got out to greet him. To my surprise, he was still in his work clothes. He claimed that he was just getting off work, which he didn't mention would be the case earlier when we set the time. I thought it was weird, but I still got in his car. He told me after I was already in his car and we were up the road that he needed to go home first and clean up. I was immediately on edge, but I didn't want to anger him or ruin the night before it started, so I reluctantly said okay. We got to his apartment, and I hesitated to enter, but he ever so gently put his hand on my back and steered me inside. He turned on the TV for me and told me to get comfortable. I said I was fine and shuffled my feet a bit. Clutching my purse and looking around the room, mentally recounting the path to the exit, I was relieved when he went into his room and closed the door. I then heard the sounds of running water. I relaxed a little and sat on the couch to watch TV. Not long after that, he came out of his room. My mind has blocked the details of this part. He was either completely naked or had a towel loosely covering his privates, but he was definitely not clothed. I thought about running, but I didn't know where I was, and this was before Uber. He tried talking to me about something mundane, as if he wasn't standing nude in front of a girl he had just met that day. I answered, but kept my eyes firmly on the TV. He finally gave up and went back into his room and got dressed. He came back out and said that he was ready to go. I was super glad to get out of there. I thought we were going dancing, and a lively atmosphere with more people around would have made me feel better. But when we got back to his car, he drove a ways until we came to a shopping plaza with stores and restaurants. In my head I thought, there's no way that there's a dance club here. And there wasn't. When I said to him, I thought we were going dancing, he said, We are, but we should eat first, don't you think? So again, while internally screaming to get out of there, I agreed to go eat with him, because now I was even further from home, and he was my ride back to my car. So in my mind... It would be best not to anger or insult him in any way. I also reasoned to myself that I would be okay in a restaurant anyway, because there would be witnesses there if he tried anything. I shudder, thinking about how naive I was back then. We get seated and order food. He then starts telling me about how I should try out the margaritas at this place. I remind him that I'm only 18, but he says that it's no big deal. He calls over the waiter before I could argue further and orders a margarita for me just one for me and nothing for himself. The waiter asked me my age and I thought that this was my way out. I quickly and loudly say that I'm 18, but the waiter frowns, looks at the guy who made a gesture that I didn't fully catch and then the waiter turns back to me and says, you're not old enough and we're really not supposed to, but I'll make an exception this time. I was shocked. After the waiter walked off, the guy I was with chastised me in a whisper saying that I should have lied about my age. I asked him if he was serious, half annoyed, half exasperated, and said that I barely passed for 18, and that no one would believe that I was any older than that. He shrugged, and I nibbled my food, bitterly cursing myself for getting into this mess, and praying that I would make it home alive. The margarita came out, and it was massive. I tried to get away with not drinking any, 
but the guy noticed and pushed it closer to me. I was desperate to keep my wits about me, but I didn't know how he would react if I flatly refused to drink it, so I took a few sips. Whoever made the drink was heavy-handed, to say the least. I was a complete lightweight, and was only about 110 pounds on top of that, so those few sips I took got me very buzzed. I had been at college for a year by this time, and learned some basics about drinking. Yeah, yeah, most of us drank underage, sue me. I tried to shovel more food in to soak up some of the alcohol, but as small as I was, I was already getting full and didn't manage to get enough in to sober up. Thinking back, the guy watched me like a hawk. Every sip, every bite, I kept my head down and could barely look at him in the eye. My vision was slightly blurry now, and I'm sure my eyes drooped a little too. I remember telling him that I no longer wanted to go dancing and just wanted to go home. Before I knew it, he settled the check, and we were out the door and back in his car. He asked me if I was drunk with a chuckle, and I told him, No, not even close, trying my best not to slur my words, but I have no idea what I looked like. I must have looked like prey, because it was at this point that he made his move. He started saying how beautiful I looked, and how good I smelled. He put his hand on my thigh and rubbed it. I tried moving away from his hands, but his car was small, and he could reach me easily. I had a lot of thoughts in that car in those short moments. I thought about tucking and rolling out. I remembered that there was a knife in my car, and wished that I had thought to put it in my purse. I thought about dialing 911, and it was that thought that snapped me out of my stupor. It was like all this time, I had forgotten that I had a phone. I started looking for street signs and buildings that I might be able to relay to a dispatcher. It didn't take long before I realized that he was driving in circles. This made me angry. I thought he was taking me back to my car all this time. The word kidnapped flashed in my head and my fight or flight took over. I abandoned all politeness and asked him why we were going in circles. He ignored my question and said that I should hang out with him at his place to sober up. He started driving faster, and I told him that I didn't want to go back to his place. I wanted to go home and to sleep. He tried to convince me that I could do that at his place, that we could cuddle up and watch a movie. The car stopped, and to my horror, we were outside of his apartment. I turned to him and sternly said to his face, You're going to take me back to my car right now, or I'm calling the police, and keep your hands to yourself. I have a knife in my bag if you try anything else. I was shaking all over, fighting back tears, and clearly bluffing about the knife. He didn't speak or move, possibly deciding if he wanted to call my bluff, or just get rid of me. He donned a noticeable scowl on his face. He seemed to decide on the latter option, and started driving again. I kept my eyes on every street sign until I recognized where we were. The car barely came to a stop when we finally got to the pizza shop, before I jumped out and ran to my car. But stupid me didn't have my keys out and ready. I fumbled them, dropped them, bent to pick them up, and opened my door. Before I could close it, he was there holding it open and refusing to let go. He was far stronger than me. He said that I couldn't leave without giving him a kiss goodbye. I briefly considered running him over, but decided against it. I gave the quickest peck on the cheek, pushed him back, and slammed and locked my door. He actually tried to reopen it. I turned on the car, but hesitated. I was still buzzed, and I knew that I shouldn't drive. But if I waited, this guy would follow me home. I was only four blocks away, and it was past 11 a.m., so I took the chance and gunned it out of there. He wasn't back in his car yet, so I had a head start. I checked my rearview mirror the whole way and drove around the block by the house and parked in an alley to make sure that I wasn't followed. I pretty much spent the rest of that night crying. He had my number and tried calling and texting me several times, but I didn't answer. The next day I went to my friend's house and told her everything. I was distraught and scared. The calls from him continued. This was pre-smartphone days and I had no idea how to block his number. 
Eventually, my friend's older sister grabbed my phone, mustered up her most ghetto voice possible, and yelled into the phone about what was going to happen to him if he didn't stop calling. The call stopped immediately after that. I never told my mother about what happened, and I never went to the police, but I also never saw that guy again. I only ever went back to that pizza place once after that, and my friend was with me. I don't remember whose idea it was to go. Maybe I wanted to show her who the guy was, or maybe we just wanted a cheap pizza. Fortunately, he wasn't in the front. We ordered the pizza, and I made the comment that he might spit in our food if he knew it was me. A rather shocked guy behind the counter asked why I would say that, and I gave him a brief rundown of what happened. He walked in the back and came back out a short while later saying that no one would spit in our food and assured me that that guy would never bother me ever again. There's always a reason to be afraid.